Hey everybody, welcome to Obscurities and Miniatures, and it's Friday, which means another obscurity in literature. Now this is pretty dang obscure. Uh, this is a relatively new set of mooks, and if you're familiar with, uh, you know, Japanese bookstores, you've probably come across a mook. It's basically a magazine book, so it is from a magazine. They're usually square bound, perfect bound, however you want to call it, and they are dedicated often to a single subject, but this is Hobby Japan Vintage. So this is the eighth volume, but all of the volumes so far have focused... Uh, specifically into fandom type model kits and buildings. So obviously there is definitely some crossover for stuff that would be of interest for watchers of this channel and people of a certain age. I mean, obviously when you see this, uh, I mean, we all remember Genesis Climber, most PETA, but uh, most of us remember it as Southern Cross, was it? God, I don't even remember now. Any, the Robotech stuff. I don't even remember. I think, no... Maybe not Southern Cross. Anyways. So this issue focuses on Artmic. Artmic being one of the big movers and shakers in terms of at least influential cyberpunk OVAs of the 80s. I mean, they did eventually go defunct, but the legacy that they left was quite the impressive. And if there's one thing Hobby Japan has always been excellent about, it is their photography. And to me, this is just chock full of all kinds of funky vintage model kits, which I absolutely love. And it's not just Japanese stuff either, let me be clear there. This the bubble gum, bubble gum crisis, cassette tapes in the back, VHS tapes I should say, there's cassette tape for the Walkman there. So we start off with a history of Art Mick. Uh, we get into what they were doing, what they were involved in. Techno Police right here being an interesting one, being an early exposure to me that I remember seeing myself as a child of the 80s floating around in American hobby shops in the local malls even uh, back in the day. And some interesting people having worked on it. Uh, Joey Saishi, the guy that does all the Studio Ghibli music actually being involved there. And uh, some of the mechanical designers doing all sorts of stuff as well bubblegum crisis being one of their major works that a lot of us of a certain age are probably familiar with up here we've got good old megazone 23 and what is it metal skin panic maddox 01 interviews and lots of nice vintage photographs of course, if you are barely literate in Japanese, that's not going to be very informative, but at the very least, there's all kinds of pretty pictures. Let's get to the good stuff, shall we? So, myself being quite familiar with a lot of these, these are all Aoshima kits. Aoshima banking on the success of what was to be an ongoing TV show, but ended up being cobbled together into a movie, the subject being techno police scanny i remember seeing this kit everywhere it had such a very unique face and if there's one thing i have always had a fondness for it is vintage model kit box art blader i can remember seeing everywhere and honestly the one that probably stands out the most is the tank from the movie this thing I can remember seeing all over the place. These are 148 scale kits. More designs. Miyatake, that's the guy. Uh, I know he did he did the Macross itself, from what I can remember. I want to say Shoji Kawamori also had a hand in Technopolis, and obviously as we move into the actual Genesis Climber Mosapeta stuff. Legios, I don't remember what it was called in Robotech. In its variations. And again, for model fans, some very fun stuff to be had here. The only thing I wish outside of having at least pictures of the box art. I absolutely would have loved to have seen the instruction manuals 
color separation paint guides. I loved looking at those as a kid. Shinji Aramaki, that's another familiar name. Megazone designer. I think he was the designer, wasn't he? The Maddox Zero One, but I always envision the power armors from Starship Troopers looking like. Well, didn't Kawamori or one of those guys end up doing those? The ride armors from Mosapita. And it's not most payata. If you look at the Japanese, Mosapita. I always thought it was like more speeda, but that sounds strange as well. Never owned one. Always wanted one. Had an opportunity in the early 90s to get a hold of some, but the hobby shop's owner up and had a heart attack and had to close the store. And then most of their stock seemed to have gotten sold to another local shop where it has languished for the last 30 years. We're not going to name names or point fingers, but we have had many discussions with the owner about getting that stuff moved. But yeah. Stores we used to grow up at had like old Imai and Aoshima kits. Guy didn't know what it was. It was like $3 for a 1 1 44th, 5 bucks for a 1 1 100th. 10 plus for anything larger than that and it was glorious we used to get all kinds of stuff this is the one that i always wanted the 1 12th scale bike kit armor i always thought that would have been a fun one to build never got around to it then again i have a big uh aversion to transforming kits and transforming things of all kinds that's just me. I was going to say there were also quite a few garage kits and resin kits out there based on Artmic properties throughout the 80s and 90s. So it is kind of cool that they actually have some of the garage kit photos. I feel like garage kits are kind of a lost thing. We don't see much of those anymore. Not to the same degree. Good old bubblegum crisis. So we get into some of these soft vinyl and resin cast kits of various figures, night sabers naturally. These are all 1 8 scale. 1988, 4,000 yen. So even back then, these kits were quite pricey. So for those of you who feel these days you're getting price gouged on a lot of this stuff, don't feel bad. Some things never change. I always liked Amaya's stuff. We used to come across these kits all the time, but nowhere near as funky as a lot of the Aoshima stuff. I mean, I love when they would do these kind of weird generic knockoff style kits of things that they'd already made. Now these are getting sent to some really obscure stuff. Some of these kits I remember seeing at like Mandarake. They're mechanical animals. I don't know how many they made. I mean, they only have two listed here, the gorilla and the bulldog, but I can remember seeing the gorilla kit before. Now, what's really neat is they have a whole section here where they had modern hobbyists take a crack at these classic kits and put what they know today to work. And again, if you can actually read the Japanese, there's a lot of valuable insight into how they go into it. History of Mosapeta. We get into Ravel and Monogram kits, even, so that's kind of cool. And that's one of the neat things about these is while they do have a main focal point for all of the vintage books, I can't remember what some of the other ones were. I, I swear I saw one on Dorvac or something. Like Gunze Sanyo made those, if I remember correctly, but then we get into stuff like, you know, old Aurora kits. AMT. I was going to say, I swear there were some Aurora kits in here. 2001 models. Mock Baron and his giant feet. I was quite sad that we never got to see any of the 
later series released on DVD. We actually did get the Red Baron, Mock Baron being the sequel, on regular DVD. All Toriyama and Dr. Slump kits. I believe those got reissued. It says they originally released in 82, but I feel like they got re-released as well. Vintage sci-fi vehicles. 1972 Ultraman Ace. Attack spaceship. Look at that box art. Glorious. Absolutely glorious. Nobody makes this kind of stuff either in 3D printed scales. That's a true shame. If I had any kind of modeling capacity, I would absolutely be putting together old funky spaceship designs that look like they belong in a 70s anime or ugly, <laughs> ugly, awful looking kaiju. That looks nice. Now this is even cooler. Tamiya magazine ad collections from the mid-60s. One of the things I can recall getting a lot of these old model kits, especially the first run stuff, was actually keeping a lot of them would have regular catalogs included with each release. And to me, I loved collecting those and just flipping through them. Oftentimes there would be kits that never got released. For as prolific as Tamiya was, they never really did much in the way of just out-and-out -out sci fi stuff. Now, this is getting pretty close. But yeah, a nice trip down memory lane. Especially, I'd say this is going to be a lot more uh, nostalgic for people of a certain age. And place and time. It's cool some of this stuff was never actually shown in the movie. A lot of these kits were just you know things that ended up that they were going to use in the movie or in the TV show that didn't come to fruition but yeah. So fun little trip down memory lane. Do take a look out for these if you have an actual Japanese bookstore. A lot of these will special order them if they are in stock. You can also hit up Amazon Japan regardless of where you are in the world and outside of shipping fees. Now I can't speak to anything outside of books but uh, for the most part anything that you can find on Amazon Japan if you can navigate it and I'm pretty sure you can translate it into English as well uh, you can get that stuff shipped if you don't mind paying shipping costs and I'll tell you this it's probably cheaper through Amazon Japan than any kind of third party seller so if there's something you're looking for obviously you can just cut and paste the title up at the top and go to town on it. There's all kinds of interesting things to discover. And who knows, maybe you can find some reissues of these kits. Then again, there's old hobby shops there that still probably have the original releases sitting there in all of their, you know, cigarette smelling glory. It's it's pretty awful sometimes, but yeah. All right. With that said, this has been High Lord Tamberlane with Obscurities and Miniatures saying thanks for watching and we will see you back here soon. Bye-bye.